Chapter 1 In the autumn of 1956, Dwight D. Eisenhower was campaigning for a second term as President of the United States. I was Sunday editor of the Winston-Salem, North Carolina Journal, and a devout supporter of Eisenhower's Democratic opponent, Adlai E. Stevenson of Illinois. Momentarily abandoning journalistic impartiality, I raised a little money among my colleagues, the munificent sum of $150, as I recall, for the eloquent Stevenson. In those days, the journal staff regarded itself as something of a family. In that spirit, Mrs. Bill Hoyt, the wife of the publisher, chided me gently about my small and no doubt improper effort. But Mrs. Hoyt, don't you realize, I replied in self-defense, that Eisenhower has had a heart attack? Mrs. Hoyt drew herself up. She was a lady who could draw herself up impressively. Young man, she said, I would vote for Eisenhower if he were dead. She and hosts of other Americans might have done just that in 1956 because Eisenhower, known familiarly to everyone as Ike, was a popular incumbent revered as the victorious commander of Allied forces in the European theater during World War II and as a man of peace the indispensable leader who in four years in the White House had kept the Cold War with the Soviet Union from turning hot and atomic. Throughout his tenure, 1953 to 1961, as it turned out, Eisenhower was one of the best-loved presidents of the century, with an average 64% Gallup poll approval rating over the eight years of his two terms. Eisenhower was, observers agreed, a father figure to the American voters of the prosperous and relatively tranquil fifties, many of whom had served under him in the European theater and, like good old Ike, were amateur golfers, backyard cooks, and going bald. A vast majority apparently believed that Eisenhower alone had protected them from the Russian bear and produced the rising material prosperity that had followed depression and war. Therefore, despite his health problems and my fundraising, he defeated Stevenson a second time in 1956, and by an even greater margin than in 1952. Many poll takers and politicians believe that Eisenhower could have been elected to a third term in 1960 had he sought it. But he couldn't, because by then the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution limited all presidents to two terms. Thus, ironically, a highly popular Republican was the first president turned out of the White House by an amendment that originated in the Republican 82nd Congress as partisan, posthumous revenge against a hated Democrat, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and his four terms. In the eight years Dwight Eisenhower was constitutionally permitted to serve as president, the public, like Mrs. Hoyt, did not seem to mind that he spent much of his time playing golf and bridge, that his closest friends were wealthy businessmen whose frequent largesse he happily accepted, and that his health was suspect. He suffered a heart attack during his first term, a small stroke, and a bout of ileitis in his second. In the fifties, liberals and many Democrats derided him as a caretaker president, rather than a strong chief executive in the White House, a judgment he may have encouraged, but that has been considerably moderated in recent years. Most voters obviously liked things Ike's way. Times were good, after all, and the national father figure surely would keep the Soviets at bay and the economy rolling.